This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. Hello, Glasgow. Hello. I'm going to have to edit that out. Let's try it again. <laughs> Hello, Glasgow. Hello. All right, that's awesome. It's time for this week in virology. This is episode number 344, and today is June 11th, 2015. Hey, everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. I'm coming to you from Glasgow, Scotland. We're at the Glasgow Science Festival. It's an event called Microtalks, an evening of infectious diseases. And we are on the campus of the University of Glasgow. And I've collected three guests who are scientists who run labs and do research uh, on viruses and virus-related diseases. We're gonna talk about their work, give you an idea uh, of what they do. Let me introduce my guest to you on my left. She is a professor of molecular pathology at the MRC University of Glasgow Center for Virus Research, Ruth Jarrett. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> and when you um, talk, you got to get pretty close with the mic, right? Can, okay. can you say hello to this wonderful... Hello. Can you hear Ruth? Yeah, you're okay. All right. Thanks for joining us. To Ruth's left. She is a senior investigative sci investigator scientist at the Center for Virus Research. Also, Esther Schnettler, thank you and welcome. Hello. You have a mic already clipped on, right? Yeah. Very good. Can you hear Esther? Yeah, great, awesome. And finally, so these two individuals are from here in Glasgow. We have one individual who is a professor at the Scripps Research Institute, which is in La Jolla, California. Glenn Nemera, welcome. Welcome. Uh, hi, Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn is an old acquaintance of mine. I have not met you uh, scientists before, but Glenn and I go way back. Way back. Do we the old guys here uh, on the panel. <laughs> speak and, for uh, yourself. La Jolla. <laughs> speak for myself. Uh, aren't you older than I am? <laughs> Probably. Um, La Jolla has weather like Glasgow, yeah, right? It's been very, very similar, so except weather, for Saturday. And, and this is, we do this podcast on a weekly basis. You can see I have a phone case that is about this podcast. And one of the um, aspects of the podcast is we always look, talk about the weather in the beginning because we're usually Skyping from different places uh, in the country. And so here, it's, this was a beautiful day today in Scotland. I've been here all week and it's been great. It's sunny, no clouds, 18 degrees Celsius. Finally, I'm in front of an audience that appreciates temperatures in Celsius. <laughs> in the US, they always tell us, do it in Fahrenheit. We don't get Celsius, but I, I get it. So it's beautiful. Thank you for the nice weather. So as I said, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the work that these individuals do to give you a sense of virology research, which is among the most exciting research in the world. You won't disagree with me, right? <laughs> uh, first, I want to learn a little bit about your histories, where you're from and where you were educated. And Ruth, we could start with you. Where are you from? Well, I'm from Glasgow. Wonderful. So I was educated at medical school at University of Glasgow. And then I did some clinical work here and then went to London where I started training in pathology. But then I moved across the pond and <laughs> went to NIH where I worked in Bob Gallo's lab in um, 1983 to 86. So exciting times there. And that was the beginning of the AIDS era, yeah, right? Yeah, I was there when wow. HIV was discovered. Exciting. Yeah, very exciting. And that made a big difference to me because I really got the sort of science bug. I mean, I, I was at that stage envisaging a career in clinical medicine, mm -hmm. but um, it was exciting and I wanted to stay in science. And I then came back to Glasgow where there was a, a new center being set up to look for viruses in leukemia and lymphoma. And uh, so I was really keen on, on joining that outfit. And although I'd always intended to go back to clinical medicine, I kind of never ended up leaving yeah. the lab. So you don't see patients any longer? Um, occasionally. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like the clinical contact, but I don't have any official yeah. clinical. So you've been at the CVR for most of your career then? 
Yeah, I mean, it wasn't the CVR then, so right. I, I was really in the Department of Veterinary Pathology, although okay. a medic working there on human viruses. Great, okay. Uh, Esther, where are you from? I'm uh, from Germany. However, I did my um, study as well as my PhD in the Netherlands, in Wageningen. Um, I studied biotechnology, actually, because I thought, oh yeah, I really like the biotechnology part and not really the microbiology part, but when I then got some microbiology classes, that was actually when I um, switched and um, decided that that part of the biotechnology was really what I wanted to do. And then I did an internship actually in Germany um, during my study, but then went back to Wageningen in the Netherlands to do my PhD there on plant viruses at that time. But viruses are transmitted by arthropods to plants, so a bit of a special branch of the plant viruses. And after that, I um, moved for my postdoc to um, Edinburgh, actually, to Roslyn, um, Institute of Roslyn, and um, started to work on arboviruses that are transmitted from ticks to humans, and worked there. And then after a year that I was in Alain Cole's lab, he was uh, taking up a job in Glasgow. So um, the whole lab moved from Edinburgh to Glasgow, and I moved with him, and then um, we stayed. How long have you been at the CVR? I've been in CBR now, so we moved 2011, so like nearly four years. How do you like Glasgow? I like Glasgow, yeah. Yeah, you have to say that. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> and we can talk later. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> Glenn, where are you from? Well, I grew up in upstate New York in Syracuse. I knew it, I knew it, everybody's from New York. Right, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so I went to uh, Syracuse University as an undergrad. And big Orange, right? Yeah, the Big Orange. Uh, and then made my way to Chicago uh -huh. um, and uh, went, got my doctorate from University of Illinois in Chicago. It's where I met my lovely wife who's here today. And um, We're making him famous. <laughs> More famous. We moved uh, to California, San Diego in 1979. So I've been at Scripps uh, for 35 plus years. You didn't do a postdoc? I did a postdoc at, at Scripps. Scripps with whom? Um, Neil Cooper. Yeah. Uh, who was a complementologist and um, had a lot of influence also from Mike Oldstone, who mm -hmm. was working with Neil on complement mediated neutralization of viruses. And I became interested in host virus host cell interactions from sort of a distant viewpoint. And that's how, long, how long have you been at Scripps now? 35 years. Do you, think, you ever think of retiring or you want to do it forever? I think about that every time I get my evaluations back, <laughs> <laughs> R1s. Yeah. But uh, keep uh, going. I, it's been it's been a great ride. I also went to school in upstate New York. I went to Cornell. Uh huh. Big rivalry. Big rivalry. It is a big rivalry. Yeah. Uh, so you also grew up up there as well. Upstate. I did. Yeah. In I moved there when I was seven years old. Oh, cool. I didn't know that, but I know a lot of scientists are from New York, yeah. just because it's a big state, I suppose. All right, so uh, you see scientists are from everywhere, but there are lots of connections, right? So you knew Mike Goldstone, and you knew Mike Bob Gallo, and right. so forth. So this is the cool thing about science, is that very few degrees of separation, as they say. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, your work. Let's start with you, Ruth. You work on a disease called Hodgkin lymphoma. So maybe you could tell us what that is exactly. Well, Hodgkin lymphoma is one of the most common lymphomas in man, so these are um, malignancies of white blood cells. And um, it's very unusual in that it has a bimodal age instance curve, so it's got a peak instance in young adults and then a second peak in older adults. And it's one of the commonest malignancies in the young adult age group, and it's important for, for that reason. And since I've been working on the disease, we know that some cases of Hodgkin lymphoma are actually caused by Epstein-Barr virus, mm -hmm. so about a third of cases. But these are actually the cases that are more common in older people and actually in children, particularly in developing countries, whereas the, the common form of the disease in young adults is, um, is rarely EBV positive. In those cases, um, the epidemiology suggests that a virus could be involved. We think that delayed exposure to a common infectious agent could be involved. So one of my interests has been in trying to see if we can find a virus in that disease. But uh, so far, unfortunately, we, we haven't found anything there. So is this a solid tumor? 
Um, well, we don't really talk about it as a solid tumor because it's a lymphoma. I mean, um, but uh, well, it yeah, it's different from a leukemia, right? Yeah. Which is a blood so, cancer. so it, it um, you know, affects lymph nodes. So most people with Hodgkin lymphoma would either present with enlarged lymph nodes in the neck or in the in the mediastinum in the chest cavity. Okay, and. You, so a, a fraction are associated with Epstein-Barr virus. Yeah, about fact. a third overall in developed countries. And w what's the global distribution of uh, the Hodgkin's lymphoma, say? Well, you know, the overall instance in different parts of the world isn't actually all that different. But what's different is the kind of makeup of cases. So we traditionally describe the disease in developing countries as being um, a disease that's mainly of children and older adults, whereas in developed countries, it's mainly this disease of young adults. And this is actually because in developing countries, you see more EBV-associated disease, and that's the disease that occurs in the children and the older adults. And then as countries develop, um, this is probably a rather simplistic model, but as countries develop, you, go to, you start to see more young adult disease, more EBV-negative disease. Mm -hmm. Is this a treatable disease, or is it sometimes fatal? Well, it, it's one of the great successes of treatment. So we would regard it now as a curable disease. So in sort of 80% plus of cases in developed countries, it will be curable. But um, some people still obviously die of the disease, almost 20%. And I mean, it, it's kind of interesting from the perspective that in order to cure it, you have to use very aggressive therapy. And a lot of the patients are young and they, then have problems later in life because of late side effects of the treatment. Hmm. So one of the, my son was on a lacrosse team in high school and one of his teammates developed uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. He had a mass on his neck and he, among the treatments he got was a monoclonal antibody against B cells. Is that a common treatment? No. It's not. <laughs> No, that, that wouldn't be standard treatment because although the lymphoma is actually B cell derived, this tumor is very unusual in that most of the, in, in most cases, the tumor cells will have downregulated all B cell markers. Mm. So it's unusual. So I see, wouldn't, it wouldn't help. So I guess he got it wrong. What is the standard well, so there treatment? Are, there are some, some cases where that, that can be used. So it's treated with chemotherapy typically? Yes, t typically. Yeah. So in the cases where, so everybody gets infected with Epstein-Barr virus pretty mm -hmm. much in the first two decades of life, is that right? Yes. Would that be fair? But not everyone obviously develops Burkitt's, um, not Burkitt's, Hodgkin's Hodgkin lymphoma. lymphoma. Burkitt's is the other lymphoma caused by EBV, right? Yeah, there are a few. A few others. Mm -hmm. So why doesn't everyone develop uh, EBV-derived tumors of some kind? Well, this has um, actually been one of the things we've been particularly interested in. Um, and we are now beginning to get a handle on some of the risk factors. For instance, our, some of our recent work has shown that there are very strong associations with HLA antigens. Mm -hmm. So your HLA type, your tissue type will influence whether you get um, your risk of getting EBV positive Hodgkin lymphoma. And even among the sort of common HLA types in this country, we see about a tenfold difference in risk of getting Hodgkin lymphoma. Also, infectious mononucleosis is associated with delayed infection by EBV. And we know that individuals that have had infectious mononucleosis have about a threefold increased instance of getting EBV positive Hodgkin lymphoma. It's still a very rare disease, so don't get worried if you've had infectious mononucleosis. So, um, do, when you say it's associated with certain HLA types, how, how do you get that data? What do you do, actually? So we've done studies where we've compared cases and controls and, and HLA type them okay. and looked at the frequency of the HLA alleles. And we've actually done GWAS studies looking across the genome to see what the, you know, which genetic variants are associated with the disease. And, and there are strong associations. So how do you think that a HLA type, these are HLA genes encode major histocompatibility proteins which display foreign antigens, how would that predispose, how would a certain type predispose you? Well, we assume that in the case of EBV-positive Hodgkin lymphoma, that the HLA types that are associated are um, presenting or not presenting EBV peptides to the immune system. And for instance, we know that HLA-A0101, which is quite a common antigen, is associated with an increased risk of disease. And we also know that this HLA antigen doesn't present e any EBV peptides, as far as we know. So we think it's, it could just be the lack of a response through yeah. HLA-A1. 
Whereas we know that HLA201 is, you know, probably has a protective effect, and there are several um, EBV peptides that are presented by okay. HLA. So it's a matter of clearing uh, the infected cells more efficiently with the right HLA, right? Yeah, we, we think that's probably the case. We don't know whether it's the control of persistent infection or actually the control of the tumour that is more important. The, our current results are favouring that it's probably more the control of the tumour cells than persistent infection, but the, the immune response could be acting at various stages right, here. Right. So do we understand how EBV infection leads to uh, tumour formation mechanistically? Mechanistically, yes, sort of indirectly, because we know that um, the tumour cells in Hodgkin lymphoma have down-regulated most um, B-cell specific genes, and they also have down-regulated um, B-cell receptor complexes on their surface. And so, of course, B-cells that don't have B-cell receptors should die by apoptosis because normal B-cells would get signals through the B-cell receptor and through CD40 molecules. But in the case of EBV, the tumor cells express the EBV latent antigens LMP1 and LMP2. And LMP2 can signal a, a survival signal mm -hmm. similar to the B-cell receptor. And LMP1 acts as a constitutively active CD40 molecule. So we think the virus is, is um, providing the signals that the normal B cell would, um, uh, would receive. And yeah. So I, I think mechanistically, there are sort of, it's quite a nice model system. So it's a matter of uh, these cells then are immortal, essentially, and that provides the virus with, this, uh, with the replication proteins that it needs to replicate its genome, for example, right? That's the idea. So does knowing um, HLA types that predispose, does that have any therapeutic value? Not yet. Mm -hmm. But I it mean, might. It, it might, yeah. We know actually, for instance, that um, EBV positive cases are more likely to be in the elderly age group, and this is an age group that to tolerates standard chemotherapy less well. So I, I think there are various immunotherapeutic approaches we can, well, that are being worked on. So you mentioned that you think that maybe the, the EBV negative uh, tumors might be caused by another virus. How do, you, how do you follow that idea? What do you do? Well, that's what I've probably spent most of my career working on and uh, probably stubbornly working on and stupidly working on um, because it, Hodgkin lymphoma is a very difficult disease to study because the tumor cells are very infrequent. They're, they're big, they're fragile, they don't have specific markers, so they're really difficult to get at. And there are no good animal models also. So we end up having to try and purify these tumor cells from clinical specimens, which is tricky. And uh, over the years, we've used a variety of approaches to look for viruses, starting in the sort of late 80s and early 90s, trying to culture the cells, which was difficult. They died, and we eventually stopped that approach because it seemed to be a postdoc grave, I think. And uh, <laughs> you know, the idea of trying to encourage anyone to come into the group and work on this and this using cell culture just became untenable. So we then moved to molecular methods for looking for new viruses, and we've, um, we've used degenerate PCR assays a lot. We played around with RDA, representational difference analysis, a lot in the late 90s and early 2000s. And what else? Subtractive hybridizations, uh, cDNA subtractive hybridizations. We tried a whole lot of things, and uh, we got a lot of funding to do the work, and then I think sort of and the funders got very frustrated that we weren't finding things. And so, of course, now we've got the tools with next generation sequencing to really tackle this, and it's harder to get the money. Yeah. Um, but we, we, we are doing, doing that, and we're sequencing mm -hmm. transcriptomes. So you mentioned, uh, cells. you mentioned earlier that you were interested in her human herpes virus 6 as, as a possible contributor. Why were you thinking about that virus? Oh, this is the this is a virus that's just never gone away in Hodgkin lymphoma. So we started in the late 80s working on this virus, and we showed that Hodgkin lymphoma patients were more likely to be antibody positive and to have high titers of antibody against HHV6. But we couldn't really, we never found it by, we were using southern blot in those cases, and we never found the virus in Hodgkin's cases. So we, we went off the idea that it was involved. 
And then we did our first next generation sequencing of transcriptomes, and lo and behold, in one of the first cases, we hit HHV6. And this was a kind of oh, heart sink moment, because you think this virus just won't go away. And at the same time, there were a couple of other groups looking at HHV6, and they had some positive results. And so, so we know there's a bit more of this virus around in Hodgkin cases, but personally, I don't think it's involved. There is just not enough. It's, it, we've got no evidence, really, that it's in all the tumour cells. So I think there's a bit more virus there, but it's, hmm. yeah, I'd be very surprised if it's doing anything really significant. So very recently, I think last week, a paper was published in Science of a method where they use phage display to pull out antibodies from human sera, and they sequence and they can tell you your history of infection. So maybe it would be interesting to know all the infections these individuals would have, and maybe you could make a, a correlation that way, not just looking yeah. at one, right? No, I mean, I think it would be really interesting because I think as time goes on, I get more and more nervous about whether another virus yeah. is really involved in these cases. But what we do know is that, that young adults that get EBV-negative Hodgkin lymphoma have probably been had some degree of social isolation in early childhood, and we think they probably will have had a different sort of mm -hmm. uh, pattern of viral infections. Right. So even if there's not a, an agent that's directly involved, I think that there, you know, there's something interesting yeah. there, and I think it's a really interesting approach. Uh, Ruth, you told me earlier you weren't a virologist, but it sounds to me like you are. <laughs> so keep pushing, okay, don't give up. Let's turn to Esther. You're interested in viruses that infect Mosquitoes and midges. You said mites also, I think? No, ticks. Ticks? Yeah. How did you get interested? Is that the plant virus connection? Probably the plant virus connection, yeah. It actually, so it's partially the plant virus connection, but also at the time when I did my PhD, halfway through my PhD in Wageningen, um, they, a new PI started, and um, Horben Pyoman, and he actually started to work on aboviruses. So, mostly on chikungunya virus, but also West Nile virus, so viruses that are transmitted to humans via mosquitoes. And I kind of, because he'd started his lab by himself, and I was like starting to discuss with him, so I got involved partially during my PhD, although I was working on plant viruses, also to do some work with him. And that was, I think, actually the main point that I really got interested into. Um, aboviruses that are transmitted to humans and then um, yeah I, I switched then for the beginning of my postdoc to not looking at viruses that are transmitted by mosquitoes but viruses that are transmitted by ticks but then afterwards I kind of switched back again and now mainly actually working on viruses that are transmitted by mosquitoes. So what is the question that you're really interested in? So, so the one part which I find really really interesting is that you have this virus which is infecting and, and replicating um, and also goes actually through the mosquito or through the ticks. Um, so it goes through two totally different organisms like mammals and arthropods which are different in so many ways. I mean they look different, different temperature, they have a different immune system or at least partly a different immune system, they don't have an adaptive immune system so they don't have antibody response to these kind of things. And it's not that the arthropod is just like, it's not just a vector, it's not just a vessel that brings the virus along, but it really, the mosquito or the tick get really infected, the virus really travels through, so it comes from the midgut, goes through the whole like kind of mosquito or tick and ends up in the salivary glands. And a lot of these viruses cause disease and um, sometimes death in humans or in mammals. However, normally if you would look at the arthropod, the tick or the mosquito, you don't really, I mean, obviously the mosquito can't tell you I'm sick, I'm not feeling well, I have a fever or something like that. But if you look at them, you don't really see like big point that they are like, they are flying around. Um, you, you can't really see big, big things that, that they seem to be ill. Although it nowadays seems to be that maybe there they is a kind of trait of so although they are not ill, they won't die from the, from the viral infection, maybe there is a trade-off of that maybe they don't produce that much eggs anymore. But this is something which I think now people more and more look into it, and a colleague of mine is actually looking more into that one, which kind of trade-off you have. So do you, do you grow colonies of mosquitoes and ticks in the lab? 
So most of the work that I did until now uh, was in cell culture. So we have a lot of different um, cells, mosquitoes, tick cells, midges, cell lines. So uh, we do most of the experiment there. Um, however, now with last year having um, the CVIS recruited um, molecular entomologists, so we are now more and more moving into um, the mosquito. So looking at what we see in cell culture in the, in the mosquito cells, do we also see the same effects actually in, in the mosquito? And then the idea is also to get genetic modified mosquitoes to, to test a few more things. And um, the, the point of these vi viruses is that they are, a lot of them are a big burden to humans. However, you don't really have antivirals that work really well against them. So prevention and therefore like vector control is still like one of the big points and although insecticides is great, I mean you see now more and more by using the insecticides, it's probably a bit similar to the antibiotics talk which we had seen, so if you use more and more insecticides you will see that actually that the mosquitoes get more and more resistant to the insecticides and a lot of these mosquitoes don't bite during the night, so sleeping under a bat net is not really helping you because the mosquitoes actually bite over the day, so you would have to run around in a net covered, which is not really... Um, Sounds okay. So <laughs> we could try. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so really, yeah, prevention and trying to, to get yeah. mosquitoes that maybe can't transmit or can't get infected. So, go, so going back to this interesting uh, conundrum, the mosquitoes are probably okay with viruses. Mm -hmm. um, and ticks as well, ticks I guess? Ticks as well, and midges at least. Midges. I mean, not that many people have looked the effect of midges on, but... So what do you think is the main, or one of the main reasons why? So as I said, I can't give a definite answer, but my opinion is that there's somehow a balance between the immune system of the mosquito, for example, and the virus. So the immune system is there, it also reacts on the virus, and it also seems to kind of keep it to a level that the virus then can still replicate and can still disseminate. However, it's not like kind of getting out of hand and therefore um, the mosquito doesn't really have, is not dying at least from it. As I say, maybe there's a trade-off because it has to put a bit more energy resources into the immune response, but I guess it's, so a, it's a fine balance. And you see, if you, if you change something a bit onto that balance, you actually see that mosquitoes are dying. So if you make the virus more pathogenic, that it can deal even better with the immune response, it's actually killing the mosquito. And probably the same with, would be that if you actually make the immune response better, you kind of clear the virus. So when you say the mosquito immune system, what, what exactly are you talking about? Um, they don't make antibodies, right? No, it doesn't or make t antibodies. Or T cells, right? <laughs> no, it doesn't have T cells. Okay. Um, so at least against the virus is what, um, what seems to be the main response is what is called RNA interference. So it's, um, it's a sequence-specific response. So what, um, what is believed or pretty, pretty much shown at the moment is that if viruses replicate, they produce like kind of double-stranded RNA molecules, mm -hmm. which normally in cells are not present. So the, the mammalian immune response seems to recognize them, and it also seems to be that um, the mosquito immune response recognizes it in the cells. And what it then does is that it takes these long stretches of double-stranded RNA, cuts it into smaller pieces, and then it takes these smaller pieces, incorporates it into a complex, and actually use that as a guide to find new viral RNA and then cut that and degrade that. And if you don't have viral RNA anymore, which is essential to produce proteins, don't produce viral proteins, so you don't produce. Mm -hmm. But as I say, that this, this works quite well, but it's not a way of really eliminating the viral disease totally. Also because the cells that are infected not, are not dying, so they just take care of the viral infection, that the viral infection doesn't get out of hand, actually. So it doesn't... This, the, this RNAi response of the mosquito doesn't eliminate the virus infection. No. So why is that? It sounds pretty good to me. That's true. Um, probably, I think there are different, different ideas. I mean, so this, this response is not typical for mosquitoes. It seems that ticks have that as well. And it's also known that, that other insects, like the fruit fly, for example, has it. Plants have it. Um, 
And it seems to be important there as well to, to regulate viral infections. And at least, for example, for viruses that infect the fruit fly, these viruses, again, encode proteins that interfere with the immune ah, response, okay. and therefore it's a kind of battle, and it's a countermeasure and a counter-countermeasure. For these viruses that are transmitted by mosquitoes, it seems to be a bit different. Like, when I started my PhD, a lot of people were looking into these viruses, trying to find these proteins, and couldn't really find them. Um, we know that we then, at a certain point, were able to actually show that it's not a protein, but it's a part of the viral RNA that seems to interfere, um, at least for some viruses. For some other viruses, we still don't have something which interferes with it. It could be that either the assay we're using to try to identify them is not, not good enough. It could be that they just don't encode it. And a different idea would also be that the viruses are kind of hiding so that in the beginning of the viral infection that they just hide, that they can't be recognized and at a certain point they will be recognized but then there's already so much there that again it can be reduced the viral load but not totally. So if you remove the RNAi system from the mosquito mm -hmm. then the, what happens when you infect them? Yeah so if you if you remove that one what you see is you get much viral much higher viral productions um, you normally still don't really see that the mosquitoes are dying. Really? Although, for, for example, if you do the same in fruit fly, that's what you see. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the reasons also that the way we, can, we do it at the moment in mosquitoes is actually that we just transiently take away the RNAi. So therefore, at a certain point, it's just coming back and you, it can, again, fight the viral infection. Um, and one of the ideas is to really see, to have a genetic modified mosquito, for example, and to see if you really take it out, what, what really happens? Right. That would be, if that killed the mosquito, that would be a good way to get rid of mosquitoes eventually, yeah, right? Yeah, yes. But that would, would be hard. Yeah, it would be hard. And also you, the idea is then how much of these mosquitoes do yeah. you have to, to release? And um, what does people yeah. think about releasing think tons world, of genetic modified mosquitoes? The world wouldn't <laughs> permit it, I think. They don't want GMO food, so they're not going to want GMO mosquitoes, right? But if you... Um, can you remove the viral antagonist from the virus genome? So as for this viral RNA that we find for, for West Nile virus and dengue virus, you can't really remove it because it's essential for the virus as well to replicate. So if you remove it, you actually have a dead virus. So you okay. can't really yeah. um, easily. Right. So this, this RNA interference sounds good. You know, the mosquitoes are OK with virus infection. Um, we don't have it, right? We, <laughs> kind of. So um, RNA interference is a, is a name for actually several pathways of, of small RNA molecules. And um, so all organisms, or at least most organisms where people have looked at, have one of these pathways, which is called the microRNA pathway. And that's actually um, important to regulate expression of your proteins. It's really important during development, but it's also important afterwards. And it now also um, for some human viruses, it has been linked for maybe that it's related also for cancer and, and Epstein-Barr virus, for example, encodes several of these uh, molecules. But the pathway that, at least in the mosquito, the siRNA pathway, which is one of the important pathways to act antiviral, there are big discussions if, they, if this pathway is present in uh, humans, yes or no. Um, it seems to be that pro most probably stem cells have this kind of pathway, but mm -hmm. if it actually really acts antiviral, um, yeah, this yeah, is a controversial. Really controversial um, yeah. And people have looked into that, I would say, for already a long time. And um, sometimes you get publications showing yes, sometimes you get publications showing no. So it's, it's really a controversial thing. But field. You know, to me, if I were designing humans, I would give them this viral defense system because it seems to work well for mosquitoes, right? Yeah, but, but that's a theory that maybe during be, having involved that we had it at a point, but then yeah. we got the adaptive immune system and that took over and because it works pretty well as well. That it doesn't seem to work as well as the mosquito <laughs> defense system, right? Yeah, well, you don't know. <laughs> mosquitoes don't live that long, yeah, right? Yeah, precisely, so you don't. And we yeah. do, so maybe, maybe RNAi is not effective over uh, long really lifespans. Long, yeah. Or something like that. It's really interesting.
So where do you want to, what do you want to have found out in the next five years? <laughs> um, so what I'm actually looking at the moment is um, looking again into one, a different, of these small, a different pathway of the small RNA pathway. And um, the hypothesis is that this pathway is, is important to really keep the persistent infection going because what actually happens is that although the mosquito doesn't live that long, if it gets infected, it actually stays infected its whole life. As I say, it, it doesn't clear the infection, so it can also, if it's once infected, can actually transmit the disease for the whole lifespan. And um, one of the hypotheses is that this pathway, the pyRNA pathway, is, uh, is maybe involved in, in not the first antiviral response, but then actually that you keep this persistent infection. And therefore, the, so what I would like to, to find out in the next five years is, is that's really true. And also, if you could maybe, in a way, manipulate that. So if you would be able to have the mosquitoes that are not infected for the whole lifespan, then that would be already probably a good, good way. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, Glenn, we'll, en we'll end up with you. I read somewhere that you've spent most of your career studying the first 30 minutes of adenovirus infection. <laughs> I think you wrote that, right? Uh, probably. Is that true? Um, well, actually, it's funny that you mentioned early on that there's a small degree of separation between yeah. scientists. And I actually started out my work uh, with Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, back in the early 80s, and uh, I was interested in um, complement neutralization of EBV, and then I became interested, why does this virus have specific tropism for B lymphocytes? And we ended up um, cloning the first uh, receptor for EBV back in the day, CD21, and then also identifying the ligand on the virus, which is GP350. And um, I think there's still some ideas about developing a vaccine for uh, EBV using that GP350 as, as a target. Um, I really enjoyed working on Epstein-Barr virus. I thought it was an, an interesting pathogen, uh, human pathogen, but I was very frustrated with trying to grow the virus <laughs> and uh, you know produces, what, 10 to the fourth particles per mil in, in tissue culture and it's very fragile envelope virus. And I was really interested in looking at host cell interactions with viruses. And I uh, looked around and human adenovirus seemed to be a much more tractable system for looking at virus host cell interactions. You could actually take parts of the virus apart and study their interaction with cells independent of the virus. And so um, we began doing that um, in the early 90s, I think. And, and uh, found that the, one of the outer capsid components, uh, known as the penton base, had an integrin binding motif, uh, a loop on the outer protein that actually interacts with cell integrins. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, um, it was thought that the virus disrupted cell by using the penton base to actually disrupt cells, but it actually was just interrupting the integrin association uh, on cell monolayers. And so um, we took that and, and showed that uh, penton based integrin interaction was really involved in the internalization of the virus. And then subsequent to that, uh, Jeff Bergelson at the University of Pennsylvania showed that there's a separate receptor on cells known as the Coxsackie adenovirus receptor that's uh, involved in the high affinity attachment to the fiber protein, which is a, a different protein on the adenovirus. So, so what kind of titers do you get with adenovirus? Um, I think 10 to the ninth uh, per mil, yeah. generally. I so. can't blame you for switching. <laughs> <laughs> Ever tried to grow UBV in culture? Yeah. It's yeah. hard, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, if you're trying to find viruses and other things, the fact that you grow a virus at all seems yeah. quite good <laughs> to us. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So, so these fibers that are sticking out from the adenovirus capsid, those bind the uh, Coxsackie adeno receptor. Right, on some serotypes yeah. of adeno. Right, and then the, the penton base binds um, the integrin receptor. Right. And you said it disrupts it, the integrin? No, um, in tissue culture, if you add um, penton, soluble penton base to a monolayer mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. cells, what the penton base does is compete 
for the integrins that are on uh, cells to detach the cells from the monolayer so they'll right. actually float up uh, if you add purified penton base. And during a virus infection, you get an excess of penton base being produced. Mm -hmm. And it has the ability to lift uh, cells off. And in the very early days of adenovirus research, it, thought, it was thought that the penton base was actually a toxic factor. Right, right. And uh, we found that it's not really toxic. It just competes for integrins. So does that have a function during entry, that disruption of uh, adhesion of cells? Uh, no. Actually, um, there's no evidence for that. But there is some reports that the soluble fiber protein itself um, can interfere with the Coxsackie adenovirus receptor in polarized epithelial cells. So it helps to disrupt the epithelial cell uh, monolayers and allow the virus to gain access to the apical surface. Mm -hmm. So um, that is one situation that happens with that. So the interaction of the base with the in tag with the um, Coxsackie adenoreceptor is essential for entry, right? Right. If you, t if you take that away, the virus doesn't get into cells. No, that's not quite true. You can, the, the virus can get into some cells easier than others with just CAR, but the uh, uptake is greatly accelerated with uh, okay. the integrin interaction. Now, now, in one of your papers, you, you wrote that actually at the cell surface, the virus starts to be dismantled, right? How's that working? Well. It's actually more the work of Urs Graber. Um, in Who I met the other day right, here. Right. So Urs has some very elegant work that shows that uh, at the cell surface you um, have simultaneous interactions with CAR and the fiber and the penton base and integrins. And then there's differential mobility of those receptors in the plane of the membrane. And it's that differential association that helps yeah. pull the fiber off and begin I this see. partial disassembly process. Huh. So he feels that that actually happens very early, even before the virus is internalized. It's funny, I was talking to him about it the other night, and he said that was your work. <laughs> I, I think Urs is being modest. That's <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's follow this through. The virus is internalized by the endocytic pathway. So now we have a virus in a capsid in an endosome, how does, right. it, how does it get out? So um, a former postdoc in my lab, uh, Chris Wiethoff, did a, a number of really elegant studies. He showed that um, what happens when you have this disassembly of the capsid where the penton base and fiber come off, there's an internal protein uh, known as protein 6, which sits underneath the vertices of the virus. And it's liberated. Um, and that protein has membrane lytic activity. And so you have an, um, hundreds of copies of this protein that are released. And what they do is insert into the membrane. Um, and rather than causing pores, it appears that the protein causes positive membrane curvature. Mm -hmm. And that puts stress on the endosomal membrane. And ultimately, the endosome breaks and allows the partially disassembled virus to gain access to the cytosol. So is the, is the re removal of this protein 6 uh, dependent on low pH in the endosome? Um, it's, I mean, I guess the bulk of information, there con the role of pH is controversial. Okay. There are some studies that show that low pH helps in the penetration process. Clearly, um, membrane penetration by 6 itself doesn't require a uh, change in pH. Um, you get similar amounts with low pH as you do with neutral pH. Um, but low pH may help disassemble the virus in the endosome, and that allows P uh, protein 6 to come out. How many molecules of this protein 6 do you need to help adenovirus get out? Do you need all of them? Do they all have to come out? Uh, we don't think so. So uh, Crystal Moyer, uh, a recent uh, fellow in the lab, has made some mutants of the virus. and. Um, it looks like there's a lower threshold of about 120 molecules that mm. might be necessary. So when you start to impede the um, release of the, um, the protein 6, you can actually stymie endosome disruption. So we think there's a minimum of around 100, maybe 150. Okay. And molecules. if you make this protein on its own and add it to membranes, it will disrupt them? 
Well, when you, we tried making this protein for crystallography uh, in bacteria, and it, as soon as you turn on expression of that protein, it lyses the bacteria. <laughs> so it's, it's, very, it's very tough to, to make, yeah, very tough to make that protein as a recombinant. Um, if you add it to um, tissue culture, mammalian tissue culture cells, uh, it doesn't, there is some toxicity, but not as much as you might expect. Mm. So what I'm, I'm envisioning this protein is coming out of the adenocapsid. It's lysing the endosome membrane. Virus gets out. So why doesn't this protein 6 go throughout the cell and just trash every membrane? How is it localized? Well, there's, there's some evidence that, um, well, not all the pr protein 6 gets out, but there's probably degradation. Uh, again, Urs Graber showed uh, by time course and looking at protein six, that there was degradation of the protein. So, and it we've noted when we purify this protein, it's highly susceptible to degradation. Um, it looks like the uh, C-terminal half of the molecule is particularly unstructured and is susceptible to degradation. So the other day when you were talking at, at the meeting, you mentioned that there's a cleavage site in this protein six for for a viral protease. What is the role of that? So there's, there's two sites for uh, protease cleavage. Um, there's a site at the C-terminus that uh, Wally Mangal and his coworker showed um, that is necessary to liberate an 11 residue peptide that acts as a cofactor for accelerating AVP activity. So there's that cleavage that's important, and it's very important uh, for maturation of the virus. And then on the amino terminus, um, it looks like cleavage at the amino terminus uh, acts to help liberate the mature six from the virus. So with it, it needs the N terminus to um, incorporate six into the virus, but you then need to cleave that peptide off to allow liberation of the mature six out of the capsid. So that's one uh, role that that cleavage serves. The other role, it appears that um, that cleavage at the end terminus helps um, improve assembly of the virus. So we notice a, a big decrease in assembly of progeny virus when you impede cleavage of that end terminus. So that, this, these cleavages occur in the virus particle? It's thought that that's yeah. the location of cleavage once right. the virus is beginning to mature. You wrote also one in another paper about the idea that membrane damage to the cell caused by this protein might be an innate immune signal to to trigger inflammation. Right. Uh, that's that's a really interesting idea. Right. So it could be um, again that's that's work of uh, more directly related to Dmitry uh, Shakhmatov, who is at University of Washington, and he showed that um, actually in macrophages, particularly in immune cells that lysis of the endosome by protein six um, signals um, a danger signal to the cell. And so you have things like IL-1 beta uh, being expressed in IL-6, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And uh, he was able to show that a mutant adenovirus that fails to disassemble in the endosome and release protein six uh, lacks that activity. Mm -hmm. So the cells have evolved to be able to sense membrane damage, right. probably so, not just by ad, but other right. insults as well. It may be a very common mechanism huh. that's been a little underappreciated. Yeah. So now the, the capsid is in the cytoplasm. It's partially disassembled, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the DNA needs to get in the nucleus. How does that happen? Um, well, I, I, the latest uh, thought is that the virus associates with uh, dynein motor proteins and uh, perhaps through association with the hexon. And um, the dynein motor association allows the virus to ride along microtubules as if it were a, a train on a railroad track. And that takes the virus to the nuclear pore complex. And then magic happens. Magic. There's, you know, probably some of the uh, uh, so-called NUP proteins that are associated with a nuclear membrane um, help to disassemble Mm -hmm. the virus further, and then DNA in a magical way is liberated from the, um, the virus capsid and is taken into the nucleus. I don't know if you've seen this model where 
not only is dynein bringing it towards the nucleus, the capsid, but kinesin motor is bringing it the other way, and the idea is just ripping it. Right. Sort of like what happens at the plasma membrane. Right. What do, you, do you think that's reasonable? Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's not a bad way to look at it. Um, I think there's still further investigation that needs to occur. We, in general, the deeper you get into the cell with virus, the really the more difficult it is to visualize in real time what's mm. going on. I yeah. think that's the direction of the field is understanding those late events, late early events and uh, egress and maturation of the virus. They're still pretty poorly understood, even for a, a virus that's been around for a long time. Why is it important to know this for adenovirus? Well, I don't know that it's particularly important. I mean, we can talk about adenovirus as a human pathogen and maybe having those as targets for um, antivirals. Um, uh, for example, adenovirus is uh, one of the major causes of mortality in immunosuppressed uh, pediatric patients who are getting stem cells or bone marrow transplants. Mm -hmm. um, it's a major cause of eye infection, particularly in Japan. 10% uh, of all the common colds are caused by adenovirus. Uh, causes gastrointestinal infections. So it is a, an annoying pathogen at the, at the very <laughs> least, and it would be nice to have antivirals. Um, and there are, um, there are antivirals being uh, looked at and examined in clinical trials and uh, other approach, immune-directed uh, approaches for adenovirus. Um, by the way, uh, we, I live in a military town, and adenovirus is a major problem in the military. And I don't know if you know the story of, um, it used to be the case where all recruits in the military received adenovirus vaccines for type 4 and type 7. And that kept uh, new recruits out of uh, the hospital um, while they were in boot camp. But then uh, the company that was making the vaccine ran out of whatever they needed to keep going. <laughs> and so the military said it's too expensive to do this anymore. And they stopped making the vaccine in roughly the year 2000. I probably have the dates wrong. And then for about 10 years, um, uh, military recruits were getting sicker and sicker. There was a, a few deaths and many thousands of hospitalizations. And even more worrisome for the military was that they were missing boot camp, having to restart, and it was more costly uh, to do that. So they decided um, to bite the bullet and uh, recontract to make a vaccine. And so now there is a new vaccine that was re-administered in uh, 2011, I believe. And uh, the incidence has gone, hospitalization of recruits has gone down by a hundredfold. Um, Interesting. Just using those two serotypes. Yeah. So why don't we use those vaccines for the general population? I, well, at the military, situation's a little different. So you have, in boot camp, you have soldiers that are nestled together in yeah. tight quarters. So I think the incidence is very much higher in the military population than is in the general population. Um, I think where vaccines would be useful in the general population, and perhaps are for emerging serotypes that can cause serious problems, severe respiratory disease. There was an outbreak of AD14, which was a uh, recombination between two other serotypes, and most of us don't have antibodies to that, and there were a lot of serious infections with that that uh, led to a problem. So you've done a lot of your work with old-fashioned biochemistry and cell culture. Yes. But you've also collaborated with crystallographers to get a lot of structural right. information, right? Right. Sort of a, in general, I like collaborating with uh, people who work in different fields to address a problem. I don't think that's unusual for, for scientists, but I very much enjoy bringing together two expertises to, hmm. um, to solve a problem. And so um, I started out working with Phoebe Stewart uh, probably 1993 using cryo-electron microscopy to study the structure of the virus. And Phoebe was a wonderful collaborator and still is, and she has uh, pushed uh, resolution of the entire virus particle to about six angstrom resolution. <clears throat> and while we were doing this, it uh, wasn't clear that we'd ever get 
high enough resolution to see the kind of details that we wanted, which is around three angstroms. And um, I began working with VJ Reddy in 1998 at Scripps to um, uh, see if we could crystallize the virus, grow crystals of the virus, and then see what we could do with those. And over the years, um, painful, long trip, <laughs> and many trips to Chicago, uh, synchrotron trips, um, we've made some headway in that regard. You know, the, the structures that Phoebe solves are amazing. Yeah. The entire virus, right? Yes, the entire virus. Because before that, people had done pieces and put them together, right? right. It's just incredible. And the, the cryo data were actually better than the crystallographic data that I think came out at the same time, right? Yes. Um, so around, um, I said, 2014, I believe, um, Hong Zhu at UCLA has a very high uh, um, cryo-EM structure of the virus, uh, about 3.5 angstrom resolution, and then Vijay uh, and I have a paper in the same issue of science uh, on the right. crystallography. Right. So what, what is it that you want to figure out in the next five years? <laughs> so, you know, we've uh, seen some of the features of including protein 6 in the virus capsid, and we would like to actually find out what's at the center of the virus, you know, like journey to the center of the earth, <laughs> if you've ever seen that movie. We know that uh, DNA is not highly organized in the virus, and so we'd like to know how exactly is it packaged and who is it associating with. Um, I think that could give us some clues to how the virus is assembled. Um, we'd like to try to analyze the structure of immature particles that are on their way to being assembled, or um, things like TS1 mutant, which is a um, hyperstable virus that can't undergo disassembly. So I think we'd like to do some of those in some of our mutant viruses to gain further insight into the life cycle of the virus. So do we think that the capsid is built around the genome, <laughs> or does the genome go into a capsid? I think the jury's still out on the mechanism, precise mechanism. Um, I would lean toward more of the capsid being built around the DNA than it being yeah. actually imported through a, a unique portal. Yeah, as for herpes viruses, there's a portal that, right. but there's no such thing for. It doesn't appear to be. There's a protein that uh, Mike Imperiali at University of Michigan um, f uh, demonstrated binds ATP like some of the other motor proteins of viruses, but it doesn't hydrolyze ATP. It doesn't fully act like a motor protein. Um, it's present in about the right number of copies in the virion to be perhaps at the vertices of the virus, but there's just very weak evidence that there is a unique portal. All right, well, thank you, Glenn. I hope you guys have got a nice sampling of some of the virology research that goes on. And this is what we do every week on uh, This Week in Virology. You can find these episodes on our website, twiv.tv. You can find them on iTunes. If you have a podcatcher app for your mobile device, you can use that to get the podcast as well. And they're all free. We have 344 episodes, and they're all available and free for your listening pleasure. If you need to pass some time, some of them are two hours long. If you need to commute or if you need to do a lot of plaque assays, uh, <laughs> you can use, use that to do it as well. And we always love getting your questions and comments. You can send them to twiv at twiv.tv. I want to thank my guests for joining me here tonight. Uh, Ruth Jarrett, thank you so much. Thank you. Esther, Sch <laughs> yeah. Esther Schnettler, thank you. Thanks. And Glenn Nemero, thanks for joining us. I know thank it's you. late. I want to thank the Glasgow Science Festival and Connor. Where is Connor? Thank you, Connor, for organizing this. Great job. Uh, some great talks before this, too. The British Society for Cell and Gene Therapy, the Society for General Microbiology, and the MRC Center for Virus Research, because all of them uh, played some role in getting me here. Uh, my name is Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at my blog, which is virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>